Hello, DEF CON. A um, little bittersweet to be presenting here to you today, unfortunately, by, rec by recording instead of in person in Las Vegas, but hopefully next year we'll be um, together. I'm Susan Greenhall. I am the Senior Advisor for Election Security at Free Speech for People. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and hopefully you can see that. Uh, um, Free Speech for People is a nonpartisan, not for profit, public um, advocacy and legal organization. And we have um, several projects that are aimed at our mission, which is to um, strengthen and improve democracy for all people. Um, we work on things like mon money in politics and corporate abuse of power. Um, and we have a specific project on election security, which I am the senior advisor for. Um, now we are here today to talk about the wireless odyssey or why the blank do we have wireless connectivity in voting machines. Um, I really want to describe all the ins and outs of a mind-blowingly reckless and stupid decision made by the federal um, agency that oversees voting technology to allow wireless networking devices in federally certified voting machines. Considering the state of confidence um, in election systems in the current cyber threat landscape, it would seem to be a complete no-brainer that we should ban all wireless networking in voting machines, but that's not what happened. Instead, um, over a tremendous amount of public opposition, the United States Election Assistance Commission, or EAC, um, extra legally with, met with the voting machine manufacturers and stripped a provision out of the proposed federal voting system guidelines that would have banned any device capable of connecting wirelessly to the internet. Um, but I don't wanna get to uh, head to, to the end, I'm skipping to the end. Um, this is some of the press about that. Um, uh, because I wanna talk about all the things that led up to the ultimate um, conclusion, which you know, put us in this position um, and sort of uh, uh, foreshadowed the fact that we would see the federal agency uh, siding with the vendors to, um, uh, to permit wireless networking in voting systems. Um, so the um, U.S. Election Assistance Commission, or the EAC, is the federal agency that is tasked with setting the federal voting system standards. Those are um, called the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. They are voluntary, but most states, uh, many states adopt them, and they um, impact the marketplace considerably, so they're quite um, influential, um, and states look to them to uh, develop their own standards as well, even if they don't require EAC certification. Um, the first set of standards developed by the EAC was in 20, uh, 2005, um, and the EAC is still certifying voting systems to this day, to, the, to those standards from 2005, so wildly out of date. Um, those standards explicitly permit wireless modems and networking connectivity, um, yet, like many um, other election officials, the EAC commissioners helped to spread the myth that voting machines are never connected to the internet. And so I'm gonna have to um, slip out of Zoom share for one second, and then I will reshare to show you the video that I have. Okay, so that's just a little sampling. There were multiple instances where the EAC commissioners made public statements or provided testimony to Congress saying that the voting machines are never connected to the internet and that the federal standards ban any sort of connectivity or any sort of wireless modems, um, but that was not true. But what was interesting um, is that, um, oh wait, I have one more video. Um, Thank you. Zoom. Okay. 
Okay, so um, we established that they have made this statement. Um, but what was interesting is that the this demonstrates the AC sort of recognized that there was PR value to making these claims, even though they weren't true. Um, yet, when the EAC actually had the opportunity to update the standards and adopt a ban into federal voting system um, that would prevent any sort of internet modems or, or a wireless net networking connectivity, they did everything they could do to subvert it. In 2015, the EAC began developing a new set of standards, which was going to be termed VVSG 2.0, Voluntary Voting System Guidelines 2.0. This process is very specifically dictated by the Help America Vote Act, um, and it's subject to other federal laws like the Administrative Procedures Act, the Federal Advisory Committees Act. Um, the standards must be drafted by the EAC's technical uh, guidelines Development Committee, then submitted to the EAC's Board of Advisors and Standards Boards, also published to the Federal Register and subject to a 90-day public comment period, All and, and as well, they also held public hearings. All of this to ensure that there was, um, you know, robust public oversight and engagement. Um, any modifications have to go through the same process. So at this stage, the EAC did two unexpected things that are relative to what unfolded. First, they separated out the standards into a high level set of principles and guidelines, things like the voting machine should record your vote accurately, um, it should be auditable. Um, and then they um, had a separate uh, document that was the very detailed requirements that would ensure that the voting system met these high level principles and guidelines and they decided that both of these uh, uh, parts of the the standards document needed to go through the same public comment period um, uh, um, public hearings advisory boards review etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then second they set up uh, topic specific public working groups. So they had one on human factors, there was one on cybersecurity, and I participated in the cybersecurity working group, as probably some of the people watching did as well. Um, this was comprised of computer scientists, advocates like myself, election officials, and vendors. After the high level principles were completed, the public working groups dug into drafting suggestions for the detailed requirements. And the issue of the wireless modems and voting machines was very hotly debated. It quickly um, became clear this was going to be a big point of contention. The vendors and election officials opposed a ban. Cybersecurity experts and advocates, like myself, were in favor of a ban. Um, and we saw we were, we were facing a major fight. Um, and so with some allies, um, we worked up a plan to try and, and engage the public on this. In the spring of uh, 2019, at the same time the wireless issue was hotly debated in the public working group, the high-level principles and guidelines were going through the public comment period, providing a unique opportunity to address this issue. Um, so, and, and we felt that this was such an important issue that it actually rose to the level of being included in the high level principles and guidelines not permitting any sort of wireless networking technology uh, technology or devices in the system um free speech uh, 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 so several um allied organizations from all sides of the political spectrum um including common cause public citizen daily coast and freedom works all sent emails to their members lists um, asking their members to send in public comments to the EAC, asking it to include a ban on wireless networking devices in voting machines. And this caught fire. Um, the, all combined, all the groups together, uh, we got over 50,000 public comments submitted to the EAC asking them to include the ban. Now, by any measure of success, that's a pretty good return on investment <laughs> to get that many people engaged in this sort of weedy wonky issue sending public comments to this tiny agency nobody no, never heard of and about voluntary voting system guidelines something else a lot of people never heard of um, but evidently the eac was not familiar with online organizing so they did something extraordinary when they started to see the volume of emails come in they shut off the email 
address that was receiving these messages um, so that the, it could no longer receive any emails. They did not make any public notification of that. Nothing in the Federal Register, nothing on their website. They um, did not include a bounce back message that would tell you this email is no longer receiving messages. Please submit your comments in another fashion. So anyone who submitted comments after they closed the email address or shut it off or disconnected it, it would have gone into a black hole and they would never know. Um, uh, and so they were essentially telling, and this was in, in the midst of the public comment period, there were still several days, like almost a week, I think a little less than a week was still left um, when they shut off the, the email address. Um, a day and a half later, they put out a tweet that said that they were asking people to go to an online platform instead to submit their comments, um, uh, but they still had not put anything in the Federal Register. And so some of the groups that had organized around this were, were pretty understandably upset, and they complained that the EAC was um, violating the Administrative Procedures Act, which requires the 90-day public comment period, and they'd already advertised it in the Federal Register. Um, because the EAC had screwed up the public comment submission so badly. The EAC agreed to extend the comment period by a week. Um, and a few days later, they published the extension of the Federal Register, which was required by law with a link to the submissions page. So a few months after this debacle in September of 2019, the EAC's Technical Guidelines Development Committee met and during the meeting, an EAC staffer gave an update on the development of the standards and the public comment period. And quite unexpectedly, the EAC staff said nothing about receiving tens of thousands of comments on the issue of wireless. Instead, the EAC staff told the committee that it had received 2,800 comments. And I have a slide on that as well, because I can show you the slide that the um, EAC, oh, shh not visible in the window right now. Okay, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, the EAC um, the EAC gave told told the 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 uh, um, committee members it was that it was 2800 comments that they had received. Um, but what happened was that the committee members asked to see the comments. They said, can we see the public comments that were received? And the EAC staff said, no. Now this, I know I have uh, queued up here. And this was the exact exchange. So this is Judd, and that's the uh, election director for the state of Colorado, who is a member of this committee. Is, are you Cliff saying that the public comments aren't public? And this is the EAC's general counsel said, the public comments have not been accepted by the commissioners to be made public. That's correct. The Colorado election director says, so we can't see or talk about the public comments? And that's pretty much what they got. No, you can't talk about the public comments. Um, they never got the public comment, or I'll qualify. They did not get the public comments um, in any timely fashion. It took about more than a year before the EAC eventually published all of those 50,000 comments and acknowledged that they were that they had been received. Um, and that was because of a lot of pressure. So just to recap, there was a clear and concerted effort by the EAC to prevent the public from submitting comments in support of a ban on wireless net network uh, wireless networking. Then the EAC expressly misrepresented the number of comments it received to its development committee. And then when the committee asked to see the comments, they said, no, you can't see the comments. The public comments aren't public. Now we skip forward a few more months. Though the EAC didn't seem to get the profound dangers associated with including the wireless devices, NIST sure did. Um, and because NIST chairs the technical development uh, committee, NIST prepared the draft standards for the committee. And in December of 2019, a NIST official gave a presentation to the committee that starkly explained that these devices create a huge uh, vulnerability in voting systems. Um, 
and that they should not be present in voting machines. Um, and then NIST provided the draft standards, which included a ban on ex an explicit ban on any devices capable of wireless networking in voting machines. This draft was voted on by the Technical Development Committee and passed on to the EAC. At this point, it seemed to be settled. Um, NIST had given its recommendations loudly and clearly, and the Technical Development Committee, which is directed by law to provide the standards to the EAC, had en endorsed that version. The draft standards were then published and put out for public comment. Um, EAC and NIST also suspended all the public working groups because the work had been done. Um, the standards were then subject to multiple public hearings and they were also sent to the EAC standards and advisory boards. In the summer of 2020, last year, as the draft standards were going through these public reviews, the EAC let slip on a call with the standards board that it was meeting weekly with the voting system vendors in a working group to solicit the vendors' comments on the standards. So the vendors had already been involved in public working groups, they provided their own public comments, but now there was a special meeting that was closed to the public that was um, uh, not being, no minutes were being published, no documents or readouts were being made available to the public, but they, that was still going on um, uh, specifically to solicit the vendors' comments. Um, um, and remember that um, that there were the, the, the public working group and they had the opportunity and that was already disbanded. So this meant that there was this new private working group. When I learned this, I immediately wrote to the EAC and asked to be added to the working group. I assumed it was maybe an extension of the other public working groups. The EAC wouldn't, wouldn't even respond. Um, so I put in a FOIA for all of the documentation and communication between the EAC and the vendors regarding the meetings to try and learn more about it. We waited for several months for the EAC to produce the documents. And while we were waiting, we started to hear rumors that the EAC was revising the standards to allow wireless devices in voting machines, provided they were disabled. But that could be disabled by software. It didn't require a physical disabling. Um, now we know the vendors like to push the wireless networking devices and electronic transmission of electronic results from polling places to county headquarters. But there are other factors that were driving this. There are vendors that are building their systems using entirely COTS hardware, and they those vendors have insisted it would be way too expensive to have to remove the wireless devices um, or any chips or radios or anything. Additionally, including the wireless devices could allow vendors to use them to update machines at the same time if they had to put in a software update or, or upgrade it. Um, rather than having to manually update each individual machine. Um, and so these are changes that we know directly benefited the vendors. We wanted to head off this terrible decision. So Free Speech for People enlisted a bunch of um, top computer scientists and election security experts to send a letter to the EAC warning of the dangers of permitting wireless devices um, and in voting machines, wireless networking devices. Uh, not surprisingly, the EAC never responded, but they did respond to the news stories um, by publishing a document that tried to spin the changes as a mere clarification um, and that the draft was never intended to actually prohibit the presence of any wireless capability. Um, this wasn't supported out by the facts or the record um, or even the EAC's own statements to the press before they decided to take this tack. So they took one tack and then took another tack. Um, on January 13th, the EAC held a meeting of the Board of Advisors, which the members, um, in, in which the members repeatedly asked about the new draft. They wanted to see it because they knew that they were voting on, uh, it was supposed to be coming up soon. Um, EAC refused to provide it to them, even though they are the Board of Advisors put there by the Help America Vote Act. On January 26th, in 2021, the EAC announced it would meet on February 10th to vote on the new voting system standards, but they still had not published this, what they were going to vote on. We still had no idea what changes they had made, if any. You know, they, they really shouldn't be making any at this stage without it going through the process again, a public process. Um, 
Uh, and a couple of days later on February 1st, 2020, they published the revision to the draft, um, which had not been subject to any review by the advisory board to the public. The new version allowed wireless devices provided they were disabled by software. It also gutted some robust requirements that guaranteed public access to any system submitted as EDE verifiable or end-to-end -end verifiable. Um, there had been a very robust provision to make sure that if anyone tried to submit a system um, as end-to-end -end verifiable to um, avoid the paper ballot requirement, they would have to make the protocol available to the public, readily available for an extended period of time for anybody that wanted it. Um, completely got it. Um, no public review of end-to-end -end verifiable systems any longer. Um, and there were some other pro-vendor changes like removing a provision to prevent the vendors from advertising on ballots. So now you can look at your ballots and have a nice advertisement from ESNS or Hard Inter Civic or Dominion. Um, nine days later, EAC voted to accept the new standards. Um, and several weeks after that, we at Free Speech for People sued the EAC over the unfulfilled FOIA request for the communication with the vendors and the private meetings. Um, that was in March we sued. After we sued, the EAC began to produce the documents and we found more details of the weekly meetings that EAC was holding with the vendors, which documented the regularity and, and some of the topics that they were covering. We still haven't gotten the full production. A few months after that, though, we sued again. And this time we did it under the Federal Administrative Procedures Act, the Federal Advisory Committees Act, and, um, and the Help America Vote Act. And so we used, uh, we sued under those um, acts and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm doing my best to um, explain. The Administrative Procedures Act requires certain um, documents to be made public, to go to the Federal Register, et cetera. Um, as mentioned, the public comment period was there were issues with public comment period. Um, the Federal Advisory Committees Act requires that any sort of um, group that's formed like the working group with the vendors that that needs to be made public. Um, keeping that private is a big no-no under federal law. Um, and the Help America Vote Act, which requires that um, when the standards are modified, they need to go back through the same public process. And they did substantially change them. So they were a modification and they should have gone back through the public comment period and um, to the EAC Standards Board and Board of Advisors. Um, our lead plaintiff is Professor Philip Stark, many of whom you know. Philip is a member of the EAC's Board of Advisors. Um, so his rights um, as a member of the board were explicitly abrogated when the EAC did not let him review the standards before they were published. Um, we are seeking relief to reinstate the original provisions and roll back these changes that were made. Um, so you can make your own judgment. Maybe I, uh, yeah, I've given you a presented a biased story here, but it seems evident to me that the EAC is an agency that is way too close to the vendors it is supposed to be regulating. And it went far out of its way to dismiss the public in favor of the vendor's preferences on this issue, while pretty brazenly flouting the federal laws that would have prevented the agency from holding clandestine meetings with the vendors and making substantial changes to the, the voting system guidelines secretly outside of the legally mandated process. The lawsuits are currently pending. Um, uh, under the FOIA lawsuit, the EAC has begun to produce the documents um, and we'll see if they continue to comply. For the second suit um, that alleges violations of federal law, we have, um, regarding the development of the standards, we have yet to see a response, so we'll have to see how they respond to that. The bottom line is that despite all of the public statements um, by the EAC and others, there are wireless networking devices in voting machines around the country, and that the new federal voting system standards adopted by the EAC when they had the opportunity to ban them all together, the EAC did everything it could to subvert that. Um, it's pretty incredible and pretty disappointing. I am happy to take any questions on the Discord channel. Um, you can read our complaints and filings if you go to www.freespeechforpeople.org. 
um, and look at legal actions, um, legal actions, but it's Stark v. EAC and Free Speech for People v. EAC. Um, thank you very much and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much.